I kicked in that last chorus tonight just because uh, I didn't know, didn't realize Jesse was doing a Revelation song. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. But that, uh, that chorus, to him who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb, just particularly grabbed me today as I was thinking about, I woke up at 3 o'clock this morning uh, thinking about this uh, first chapter of Hebrews, among other things. But as I laid there in the bed and prayed in the Holy Ghost, I got a, a, uh, just a, a, a huge picture of uh, just how big Jesus is and how merciful he is. When you think about our Lord, and he's referred to as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, but at the same time he's referred to as the one who sits on the throne. Now that, that's kind of an odd pairing, isn't it? A lamb who sits on the throne. When you think of somebody on a throne, you think power and, and might and be blessing and glory and honor and power. That's what we just sang, right? But uh, unto him who sits on the throne and unto the lamb. What an incongruous uh, pairing of ideas, isn't that right? Uh, royalty and sheep. When you think of lambs, you, you don't think of... Uh, yeah, so that you're, talk, you're thinking gentle, meek, sweet, etc., right? And you think of throne, right away that changes your picture, doesn't it? And I think that's the, uh, I don't know if it's a paradox or, or what you would call it exactly, but the, the grasp of just exactly who Jesus is, I think sometimes is, uh, is beyond our ability to, to uh, wrap our head around. So we're going to try tonight to wrap our head around a couple of things. Let's look in Hebrews chapter 2 as we continue our journey. Hebrews the second chapter. Because we're going to take those first four verses that we, we uh, designated as our thematic passage for the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2, the first verse says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Look at somebody and say, don't drift. don't drift. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Remember the, uh, the word spoken through angels is a reference to the old covenant. Remember, we talked about that at some length. So when he begins to compare the greatness of the Lord Jesus to angels, that's why. It wasn't just that he was trying to prove that Jesus wasn't an angel. He was trying to, to uh, uh, emphasize how much greater this new covenant is than the old covenant. The old covenant came through angels. This covenant came through Son, we found in the first verse of Hebrews. The, uh, he says here, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. Uh, we started digging through the book of Hebrews, trying to uh, get a grasp on such a great salvation that has been provided for us. In the Old Covenant, he spoke through angels, and in the New Covenant, He spoke through Son. In this last day, He has spoken to us in Son. Amen. And we talked about sonship. And then we began looking, uh, beginning in verse 5, at the comparison that the author of Hebrews began to draw between the things the Lord said to and about angels and to and about the Son. He makes that comparison throughout the first chapter of the book of Hebrews, and that's an important distinction. And I couldn't figure out how to approach it, so uh, last week we uh, looked at the things he said to and about angels, and the big things we discovered was angels are messengers. They're messengers and they're workers. They're on an assignment, they have a specific job, they can't make up their own job. Amen. Uh, they obey the word of God. And they're, they came with a message, but they don't get to write the message. They just get to deliver the message. They don't get to make up the message. So when the Old Covenant was brought by messengers, but in the New Covenant, He sent us the message. The Word was made flesh. 
and dwelt among us. Praise God. So the new covenant wasn't brought by messengers. It was simply the message in person. Now, uh, having looked at that, we want to go back and see some of the things that the writer of Hebrews was trying to tell us about the nature of this son that is so much greater than the angels. First of all, well, I guess we better read the passage first. I don't want to get everybody any more confused than they already are. There's a lot of preachers, you know, if they could just achieve that, they would have had a better day than usual. They could leave people no more confused than they were when they got there. Anybody ever been in those services? At the end, instead of amen, you just want to go say, huh? Yeah. Amen. So if, they, if that's the best you can do, strive for that goal. Don't confuse them any worse than they already are. Hebrews chapter 1, let's begin in the fourth verse. Having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance, obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. So we saw a number of things in that passage that he said to and about the angels. But what a massive amount of information he gave us, amen, about the Son. He said to the angels, nobody ever said, you're my Son, today I've begotten you. Amen. I'll get back to where I need to be here. Yeah, I said a lot last time, didn't I? Here we go. So we notice, remember in uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 1, he emphasized the fact that Jesus, the Son, by whom all things were created, remember? Uh, but he also emphasized the fact that uh, he made the worlds, but he has now appointed him heir of all things. The emphasis being, he made the worlds through him, but now he has appointed him heir of of all things. So there was an eternity past. He was always the second person of the Godhead. He didn't just uh, you know, achieve Godhood status uh, when he was incarnated. He's always been God. And then in this, uh, after the cross, there's he, his status is now he's an heir of all things. He has by inheritance obtained a better name than the angels. Think about obtained a better name. What does that mean? Whatever it is, it didn't happen until after he was resurrected. So he's always been and he's always been God, but after the resurrection, something's different. Amen. The Son has always existed, but now there's a new covenant revealed. What makes the difference now? The God who was there in creation John chapter 1 tells us there was nothing made without Him. Remember that? He became a man and showed us God in the flesh. John 1, 14. Amen. And dwelt among us. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Verse 18 says He brought God out where we could see Him. That God who was made flesh, that Word made flesh, was crucified, dead, and buried. 
And this same man and God is now alive again and offers us a salvation that is entirely tied to who he is and what he did. That salvation was never available prior to the resurrection of the crucified Christ. Remember the introduction to this discussion in Hebrews, having become so much better than the angels. Everybody say become. Does that mean that as God eternal past, He wasn't better than the angels? No, He clearly was better than the angels as the second person of the Trinity even before He came to earth, wasn't He? Don't you? I mean, God is God after all. Wasn't He better than the angels? But it says He now has become better than the angels. And He has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Something happened to the person of the second person of the Trinity in that episode of incarnation, burial, death, burial, and resurrection. He has become. Apparently somewhere along the way, there was a juxtaposition of the eternal second person son with the angels. Amen. Now chapter 2 will be almost all about that. He was God. He became man. He never ceased to be God. But he for a while laid aside his mighty power and glory and lived as a man. And on the other side, of, on this side of Calvary, he has now again become greater than the angels. And we'll take a look at that. It says he has now obtained by inheritance a wonderful name. Verse 5 begins the comparison of the name on this side of the cross, the name being a summation, uh, shorthand for everything He is, all that He has accomplished, amen, and what belongs to us because of the person of Jesus Christ. So, in verse 5, He begins to talk about what's the difference in this name. It's not the same name that walked the shores of Galilee. But it's the name that's seated at the right hand. His resume has some amazing new additions. It gives us some characteristics of the resurrected Son that makes this new Son covenant better than the old angel covenant. Are you with me? Amen. Try not to confuse you. Okay, so verse 5 tells us, by which, to which of the angels did God ever say, you're my son, today I've begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father and shall be to him a son. The answer to that question is he never said that to any of the angels. <laughs> but he did say it to Jesus Christ. He said it to Jesus Christ. It says, this day I have begotten you. What day would that be? Some theologians argue that he's talking about, they call him the eternally begotten. Oh, get a, give me a break. Jesus is son now in a different sense than he was on the Genesis side of the cross. Here on the Revelation side, he is in some sense begotten at the resurrection. Jesus, when he came into, uh, some people try to make this mean the incarnation. Why? Because in John 3.16 he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So when he says, today I have begotten you, you say, well, see, he's talking about the incarnation. I don't think so, but he sure was uh, begotten uh, as a human being at the incarnation when he took upon himself flesh. The, the word for uh, only begotten is, is one long word, monogenes. It means uniquely, one of a kind, and one and only, born. Genes, because where we get our word genes or genetic. Right? So he was uniquely born or begotten. Nobody else had, up to that point in time, had ever been begotten that way. At the incarnation, there was only one like that. In verse 5, talking about the incarnation, is it talking about the incarnation or the resurrection? Well, uh, if you... Uh, 
Look in Acts 13.33, Paul quoted from Psalm 2.7. Talking to the Jews there, he said, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus. As it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. You got to have help to make that mean anything other than the resurrection, don't you? He raised up Jesus. What do you suppose that's referring to? It has to be referring to the resurrection. And he says, God said, you are my son, today I have begotten you. What day is he talking about? Resurrection day. Amen. What happened? Well, uh, one of the great controversies of my lifetime has been uh, arguing over what happened. How did God get born again? Think about that for a minute, because that's kind of what he's saying here in a strange sort of way. So what does that mean exactly? Well, uh, here's my theological response to that subject. I have no idea. (laughs) I do know this, that it clearly says that God the Father spoke to God the Son on the resurrection day and said, Today I have begotten you. What happened? Well, something happened that made the term begotten applicable to the resurrection. Some people use the terminology, Did he die spiritually? Well, first of all, That depends on what you mean by die spiritually. Some people throw that term around like the Bible simply says, here's what it means to be spiritually dead. It doesn't. People infer it from a number of different scriptures, most of which have absolutely nothing to do with the subject. But uh, spiritual death, as the Bible talks about it, is a separation from the life of God that in men, in human beings, is caused by sin. Ephesians 2.1. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. One of the uh, most common uh, sightings that we use for that. There are several other places we could turn and look. Uh, we could look at uh, Romans 8, 6. To be carnally minded is death. Ephesians 2, 3. They were all separated. Colossians 2, 13. Once again, dead in your trespasses and sin. Romans 5, 12. Let's look at Romans 5, 12. I don't want to belabor this point, but you know, people have to fall out over stuff and try to make things make sense to the natural mind that just don't make any sense to the natural mind. Sometimes you just have to say, you know what? He's God and I'm not, and I'm just going to believe what he said about the subject. There's a doctrine that you need to remember. He's God and you're not. Verse 12, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, who was the one man through whom sin entered the world? Adam. And death through sin. So death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, until the law, until the law, what was the, who who brought us the law? Moses and the angels, right? Okay. So, Uh, we got several hundred years here between the fall of Adam and the coming of the law. He said, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. Imputed means it didn't go to your account. It wasn't on your heavenly bank account anywhere. Nevertheless, verse 14, death reigned from Adam until Moses even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. Amen. So death reigned from Adam to Moses, even though there was no law. What does that mean? Uh, men were dead spiritually. There was, there was death working in them. <clears throat> so uh, we can see some things that let us see that death came through sin and that death reigned even though everybody wasn't dead physically. So there was a spiritual aspect of death that he's talking about there. 
in, the, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, he says, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. He's obviously not talking about physical death for most of us. Most of us weren't physically dead before we came to Christ, were we? We were, what, spiritually dead. So there's, there's some sense in which that's true. If we look in, uh, or we think it through, think about it for just a minute, in, uh, look in Ephesians 4. Let's look there. Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And there's a whole long dissertation we could go through to get there, but let's look in uh, verse 17. For this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the hardness of their heart. That's the New American Standard Version. Excluded from the life of God. In uh, the New Living Translation, it said, their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they've closed their minds and hardened their hearts. Amen. Verse 18 in the New King James says, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. I think that's, uh, that's about as close to a definition as we get. Life, the kind of life that God lives, the kind of life that we have to have in order to stand in the presence of God, that kind of life we are alienated from by our sin. And our hearts are hardened. So, uh, death then would be simply this, the absence of life. Are you listening to me? Uh, some people say, well, uh, spiritual death means separation from God. Well, what does that mean? My Bible says that if I go to hell, there he is. So what does it mean, separation from God? Okay. Amen. Well, go back and, and read it. It's in there. Amen. So, a lot of theological terms, you know, people throw around uh, things they heard somewhere in a sermon sometime, like, like it makes sense. They never stop to actually think about what it means. Uh, I've been struggling with that term spiritual death for years because uh, I, I learned this uh, coming up through Bible school, you know, that, that Jesus died spiritually. And uh, then as soon as I preached that, of course, somebody called me a heretic and told me I wasn't saved. Really? I didn't know that. So I, I started at, you know, thinking about, well, what does that mean? When I say that, what in the world does, it, does that mean that the second person of the Godhead was separated from the first person of the... What, what in that, that doesn't make any sense. What is, that, what is that about? Did he cease to be God for a few minutes or what? I don't know. Amen. Well, those are all good questions when you throw that term around. So what does it mean to be spiritually dead? Well, I think it means to not be spiritually alive. I mean, what does it mean to be dark? Not have light, exactly. What is darkness? It's the absence of light. What is death? It's the absence of life. Are you with me? Amen. So spiritual death simply means you're not alive. You don't have the life of God in you. You're as, as uh, verse 18 said here, you're alienated from the life of God through the hardness of your heart. Are you listening to me? Okay. So, do, uh, beyond that, I don't think the Bible tells us what it means, to be honest with you. I think that's as close as we get. And I've spent a little bit of time trying to look. You see, Jesus brought life to the earth when he came. John 1, 4. Remember? In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Unfortunately, those who were living in darkness took one look at the light, and like cockroaches, ran for the cover. <laughs> Anybody got friends that are... Anyway. Well. Here was the problem. Listen to me now. You're going you're to get something here. I just know you are. 
I've gone to a lot of trouble to set this up, so don't make me, don't make me have to come back. <laughs> Jesus came. He was incarnated. He was uniquely begotten as the incarnate Word of God. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. Right? He's got a problem. The people that God sent him here to rescue are all dead. And the life is only in one man. Here's the problem. <laughs> How do I get the life that's the light of men from Jesus and into Henry? How's that going to work? And that's what the rest of Hebrews is about. Hmm? Jesus experienced something. I won't pretend to tell you I know what it is. But 2 Corinthians 5.21, let's look there. Am I making sense to you? See, Jesus here on the earth, He's the second person of the Godhead. He's laid aside His mighty power and glory, but He's still God, but He's got a human body. And the life of God is in Him. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. But every time He turned on the light, everybody ran for cover. How is He going to bring that life into your heart? Fortunately, there was a plan. Long before the theologians came along, there was a plan. 2 Corinthians 5.21, of course, says, For he made him who knew no sin, everybody say that Jesus didn't know no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He was made sin. It doesn't say he sinned. It says he was made sin. How did he get to be sin? I don't even pretend to know how that worked. But God, after all, because I have people telling me all the time, well, that couldn't be. Are you telling me God couldn't do that? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Yeah, that won't work. Okay. He's God. I, I, I just have to trust that He figured it out. He made Him to be sin, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. It doesn't say He sinned. Our sin was imputed or put on Him. Amen. Say, well, how does that work? I'm not sure I'm even supposed to know. <laughs> he didn't sin. First Peter 2.22 said, He committed no sin, nor was deceit found in His mouth. Amen. He experienced the result of sin for us. One of the most fascinating verses to me in all the Bible is Matthew 27, 46, where it says in about the ninth hour. Anybody remember what happened on the ninth hour? Lights came back on. Remember, it was dark for a space of about three hours from the sixth hour until the ninth hour. Anybody ever notice that? It was dark until the ninth hour. What happened at the ninth hour? When the lights came back on, the Lord Jesus cried out with a loud voice. And he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The incarnate Son of God hanging on Calvary's tree after three hours of darkness as the impact of sin landed on Him. When the lights came back on, His first response was, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A couple of things stand out. First of all, that's the first verse of Psalm 22, in case you didn't know that. Psalm 22 is a beautiful prophetic psalm of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary. And it begins there, it doesn't end there. Amen. So Jesus cried out by quoting 22nd Psalm. I suspect he probably knew it. 
But he didn't say, my father, which he always did. Now he said, my God. Something happened. The son no longer sees God as his father. He said, why hast thou forsaken me? Now either Jesus was delusional and lying or he thought God had forsaken him. What does forsaken mean? I thought you'd never ask. It's a verb that's derived from two separate roots. The Hebrew Bible, from Psalm 22, tells us it means to leave, to abandon, to forsake, or to loose. It can be used to designate going away to a new location or to intentionally separate oneself from the company of another person. The Greek word means to desert or to leave behind and alone. So I don't pretend to know what happened, but whatever it was left Jesus hanging on that tree when the lights came back on with a horrible sense of having been left by his father. I believe there's some other scriptures in the Old Testament that we could uh, preach for the fulfillment thereof. Uh, but uh, for the purposes of tonight, uh, are you convinced? When somebody asked you, did Jesus die spiritually? Just ask them, so what does that mean exactly? And then you don't have to say anything else because they don't know. <laughs> you already won the argument because they have no clue. So I'm just going to say, well, when you figure that out, come back and ask me the question again because, see, I, I, I don't know. So you'll have to explain to me exactly what that means and then I can tell you. Amen. Was he forsaken by the Father? I think, unless he's a liar, I think we have to say that he was. What does that mean? I think we have to say, I have no idea. But whatever it was, it must have been awful. Amen. He was left alone and forsaken so that we would never have to be. So that in Hebrews, thank God for the book of Hebrews, in verse 5 and 6, it said, we can boldly say, he will never leave us forsake us. Hallelujah. Glory. He was forsaken, so we never have to be. Praise God. Hallelujah. That'll preach. Amen. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Acts 2.27, quoting Psalm 16. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, in his preaching, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ at his crucifixion and, and his burial, said, For you will not leave my soul in hell, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. How many of you know in order to leave a soul in hell, it's got to be there first? Hey, do you know what that means? Not a clue, but I know that his soul went to hell. I do know that. Because I can read. Amen. To which of the angels did he say, you're my son. I'll be to you a father and you'll be to me a son. The, you see, the emphasis here is on what happened after the cross. There's been a new revelation of the father-son relationship and it's now the emphasis. No angels have ever been sons in this sense. But there are some other creatures that were about to become sons in this sense. If you go through the book of Hebrews, you find him talking about the sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, here in chapter 1, you find it... Uh, uh, three times, four times in the first chapter of Hebrews. You find it in the third chapter of Hebrews twice. You find it in the fourth chapter of Hebrews, the fifth chapter of Hebrews twice, the sixth chapter of Hebrews twice, and again in the tenth chapter of Hebrews. Different aspects of the sonship of Jesus Christ and what that meant. But in Hebrews chapter 2, he says that the captain of our salvation came to bring many sons to glory. Hallelujah. And he begins to talk about the sonship of others. These verses are emphasizing that specialized kind of sonship that came on this side of Calvary. 
And we begin to see the aspects of that that never existed before. A man who came up from death, hell, and the grave and made the life that was the light of men available to transform the hearts of men. Glory to God. And bring a whole new generation of sons into being. Glory to God. I'm going to dance if I'm not careful. <laughs> Verse 6 said, And then he again, when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. The emphasis in this passage is the identity and character of the amazing person who is the message. And in this so great salvation, that is a person and not a formula. He is the one who was in charge of all creation and who became eternally a man. 1 Timothy chapter 2, in the fourth verse, I'm going to read the Message Bible. It says, He wants not only us, but everyone saved. You know, everyone to get to know the truth we've learned. That there is one God and only one. And one priest mediator between God and us, Jesus, who offered Himself in exchange for everyone held captive by sin to set them all free. Eventually, this news is going to get out. Hallelujah. He said there's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Oh, He had to be born a second time as the man on this side of death who is yet God. Nobody had ever had that experience before. Think about that for a minute. When He was incarnate, He was still God. He was a man, all right. But never could get His life into you. Why? Because of your sin. Something yet had to happen to make that entry into your heart possible. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the firstborn. The word firstborn, the Greek word is prototakos. I knew you wanted to know that. But it can mean two things. It can mean literally the eldest child, the firstborn of a, of a family. Or it can mean uh, someone who's in charge of something. The head honcho. And in Colossians 1.15, it's used twice in uh, verses 15 and again in verse 18. And it's used both ways. The first time he says, he's the firstborn over all creation. What's that? He's emphasizing the fact that he was in charge of creation from the get-go. On the Genesis side of the cross, He was the firstborn over all creation. But if you go down to verse 18, and He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He may have the preeminence. The first, what kind of firstborn is He on this side of the cross? The firstborn from the dead. Hallelujah. What's He saying? Something changed. He was always the firstborn over all creation. All right, well, He's God. But on this side of the cross, He's the head of the body, which is the church, the firstborn from the dead. Now think about this for just a minute. If there's a firstborn from the dead, they got to be a secondborn. He didn't say. Remember, in, the, in John 3.16, He said God gave His what? Only begotten Son. But on this side of the cross, He said He's His firstborn. Son, something changed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Are you with me? Am I making sense to you? If this isn't good news to you, then you need to get another dip <laughs> in the fountain filled with blood. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. He is clearly delineated in that passage as the eldest child in the resurrection son family. Romans 8.29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Glory to God. Look at somebody and say, that's us. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Woo! He designates Jesus as an object of worship. This refers to Jesus on this side of the cross. The resurrected Lord is God and worthy of the adoration of of His creation. He was the firstborn over all creation on the Genesis side of the cross. He's still the firstborn over all creation on this side of the cross, but He's now also the firstborn from the dead, the head of the body, which is the church. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That never happened before. 
Verse 8 says, To the Son, He says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of Your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, Your God, has anointed You with the oil of gladness more than Your companions. This is a direct quote from Psalm 45. Jesus is God. How do you know? It says right here, God said to Jesus, Your throne, O God. What's that mean? God the Father just called God the Son, God. Amen. He said, the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. What's he talking about here? He's talking about the regal nature of this resurrected Son. He's the leader, the king of a kingdom. And it says here, you loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above all your companions. Several things in here we can see, but one of them is simply this. That this anointing with the oil of gladness came from God on this side of Calvary. This is something that happened to Jesus from the Father after the resurrection. The anointing was an anointing, uh, and I love joy services like anybody else. We all just laugh and have a good time. But what he's talking about here is the anointing they used to set a king into office. It was called the oil of gladness. Why? Because when you get to be king, you get happy. (laughs) And what does it say? Up until then, he lived as a man. But on this side of the cross, as the resurrected son, something changed. It says, the anointing of the oil of joy did what? Elevated him above his companions. Prior to the cross, he had companions. We're men. We're all men. We're all people. We're all human. We have that that, uh, uh, human body. We're walking around. On the other side of Calvary, there's just one like that who gets to be king and is anointed by the Father and set in place with a throne and a scepter of his kingdom. And we could go into the fact that he never sinned because he loved justice and hated lawlessness. We could make that that case from these verses. But I think the big case we can make here is this guy is God. He's a man raised from the dead. He will be eternally a man, the man Christ Jesus, but he is anointed with the oil of gladness above all of his brethren and companions. Hallelujah. On this side of Calvary reigns a man without sin who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, chapter 4 says. Why? Because he was a man. He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And now he's the king of the kingdom. So that when we have difficulties, what? He knows exactly how you feel. Acts 17.30 says, Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has ordained. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Hallelujah. Did you ever read that verse? And listen to this. He will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising Him from the dead. (laughs) Glory to God. Something changed. And the judge of all eternity is a man who's touched with the feelings of your infirmities. Glory to God, hallelujah. And He will judge everybody. Verse 10, And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hand. You think He's trying to tell us that this is God? This is the Father speaking to the Son. What did they say to the Son? You're the one that created all this. Verse 11 says, They'll perish, but you remain. They'll grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You'll fold them up and they will be changed. But you're the same and your years will not fail. Jesus was the agent of creation. All creation is going to perish. But Jesus will remain. That's why in Hebrews 13.8, the writer of the book said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His Godhood and Sonship has never changed. Isaiah 34, 4 says, All the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll. Amen. Amen. At the end of the millennium, there will be a great white throne judgment, and all the dead will be thrown into the lake of fire. 
and then the heaven and the earth is going to be dissolved in fire and nothing will be left. But the great heavenly Jerusalem will descend from heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. I mean, did you ever read that? The resurrected Son will be the ruler of all eternity when this creation is rolled up and folded. Hallelujah. He says in Revelation 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sun. See, I'm sorry. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Skipping down to verse 21 in Revelation 21. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. The street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Woo! Glory to God. Hallelujah. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is the light. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Something changed on that resurrection deal. Amen. And here in Hebrews, he's telling us this same God that created the universe is going to be the same God that's going to come back and judge the universe and is going to fold up the universe and burn up the universe and then rule in the heavenly Jerusalem when it comes down. And He will be the light. You won't need a son. Woo, glory to God. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Revelation 1 8. Glory to God. Amen. Verse 13. But to which of the angels? Has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? The answer, none. So what's he telling us? He just brought us. He said, this Jesus was forsaken by the Father and was begotten on the day of the resurrection as of this side of the cross, Son. And in that sonship, there are some new things going on. Amen. He has inherited a better name than the angels. He has become the firstborn from the dead. He has become the head of the body, which is the church. Amen. He has ascended to heaven, and in heaven and from heaven will judge the world as a man seated on the throne, loving righteousness and hating lawlessness. He will be the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he will personally fold up and burn this creation and establish the new one, and the light of his glory will light it. But for right now, the Father said, sit down at my right hand until all things are put under your feet. That same God who created the world, the same God who will judge the world, the same Lamb who will shine as the light of the world is seated right now at the right hand of God. And He is there for one purpose alone, and that is to intercede on behalf of you and I as we are transformed into His image. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Amen. Let's stand up. Well, we got through the introduction. <laughs> Hallelujah. I love in Acts chapter 2 when the Apostle Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost, you know. Beginning in verse 33, it says, Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. <laughs> For David didn't ascend into the heavens, but he says of himself, 
The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Amen. Hallelujah. He said, he ascended and is seated at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, and he poured out that which you see and hear. Glory to God. Did you know we're supposed to see and hear something? Amen. The unsaved are supposed to be able to see and hear something. Amen. The Holy Spirit that was poured out in that day hasn't ever left. Glory to God. And the exalted one is still seated at the right hand awaiting that day when the trumpet blows. We get to get out of here. Glory to God. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God forever. Let's just lift our hands and worship Him for a minute, can we? Oh, we just worship you. We worship you who sit on the throne. We worship the Lamb. We worship the Lamb of God that has taken away the sin of the world. We thank God for the eternal Son who gave up His Sonship and went from my Father, my Father, to my God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? And yet in this day has been raised because... His Holy One could never see corruption. His soul was not left in hell, but He was exalted to the right hand of God the Father and poured out the Holy Ghost on the church, transforming the hearts of men and letting the light of life explode into a firstborn, then a secondborn, then a thirdborn, and then a youborn. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Thank You, Lord. Thank You, Lord, for being willing to suffer on our behalf. God the Creator, God the Word, God the message made flesh, willing to lay down that holy life for such a one as I. Oh, thank You. Thank You, thank You, thank You for the resurrection. For the resurrection that gives us assurance of that which is to come. Jesus Christ, the same, yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, we thank You for it. We praise You for it. Thank You, Lord. Father, I commit these precious ones to Your care. This is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church. And I thank You, Father, that You have careful, careful, careful watch over each and every one. In Jesus' name, Amen. We should have somebody over here to pray for people. Who's that? That y'all?